Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, I'm sorry to have you kept waiting. Um, so, I don't have a presentation. I was kind of thinking of more of a whiteboard kind of thing and discuss what we want to do in Boron with clustering, with respect to uh, stability, upgrades, all, how do we evolve this thing? Because it, it is the core of, of open daylight. Everybody's using it. Everybody sees a few problems. Um, we have a few developers working on it, so we kind of need to uh, focus our resources, uh, get into alignment, what we're doing, who's doing what, when, and what we want to get out of, out, out of this release. And I would kind of like to solicit also feedback what would the experience is, what, what can we do better going forward. So I guess everybody knows the SID and, and the password, so I'm just going to flip this. Um, and I guess start off uh, with a couple of things that, uh, things that we uh, talk with uh, Moise and Tom. Uh, what what needs to be done to to get the the code base into a better shape so everybody can well e essentially jump in and and get something fixed because currently I think clustering is something like what forty seven or sixty thousand lines of code and it's not really easy to get into it and understand what's going on where so um, I'll just write down, write, write down the item so um, item one essentially was um, upgrading to to Akka and get get advantage of uh, Java 8 and kind of start start working on that. Uh, we've already upgraded Scala to 2.11, so that was upgrade. Um, Scala uh, 2.11 and Akka uh, 2.4x. We already do have patches. <laughs> Yeah, come closer, please. <laughs> um, so, so we already have Scala upgraded. We actually did that, that in Berlium. I think there, there was a substantial um, performance boost coming out of that. I think it was somewhere, somewhere around 10% or thereabout. Um, yeah, and it's really sim well, made, made things simpler a bit. And the Akka, it's up for review. I mean, uh, you, you finished up the... It's in progress. It's in progress. I've actually tested it. Um, and no backwards compatibility issues. But I saw it with the uh, level of the team. So in other words, the database that was uh, written to 311, yep. the previous version, 241, the yep. Thank God. Yeah, so, so, so the per persistence didn't get break, broken be between real estate. Yay! <laughs> okay. um, yeah. So, yeah, I just touched on that already. And uh, just simple replicating, I'll have to call the follower. It really seems to work. So, so. hopefully yeah. it's better, you know, performance will be a little bit in Akka. So, so, so the second part that, that we, we kind of looked at is uh, making the, the code base more modular, um, kind of untangled uh, solid distributed data store, um, because it currently hosts the distributed data store, the entity ownership service, the configuration admin for, for shards, which kind of, they, they are related components, but some of them are loosely coupled and just use APIs provided by the data store backend and just build functionality on top of that and con control it, whereas the, uh, the other part is it has a front end and back end. And the, the interactions between <laughs> them um, are not that clear because while we, while, while we have some, some documentation around that, um, a lot of times if you, if you just open a file, you're not, you're not sure whether you're looking at the front end code or the back end code um, and how it relates to, to, to do all, all the other things. So. Uh, the other point is to make um, um, make code base more modular. Just to make sure everybody on the same page, Boron requires Java 8, right? Which is to say, we will not make anybody try to run. At at this point, at this point, you cannot 
compile Open Daylight with Java 7. Okay, it will work. Okay. So e even so, even though you can you, you can compile a downstream project, it will not run on Java 7. So that's that's went in something like three weeks ago or thereabout. It was just using I think byte to unsigned byte or something some library function that went in, and we actually uh, do have a, a conversion to to use lambdas lined up in one of the patches I submitted over the weekend. So, so that, that, that <laughs> yeah, yeah, Eclipse does auto convert, so you get, yeah. get, get these surprises, yay. <laughs> we no, no, no longer have a function there, it's a lambda, cool. So that's essentially making sure that we have uh, the front end uh, backend split. Um, and the, the reason this is important is to is to kind of force the, the thinking about, well, what is it that the backend sees when somebody executes a transaction chain and what flows are there, what's the handoff between front and backend? Because, well, currently if, if you submit a large transaction, for example, um, and it takes a while to, to process at the backend, the, the front end, all, all it sees is a uh, ask timeout and nobody knows what, what's going on and even though uh, everything is kind of fine because it's going to recover in five seconds or, or whatever. Suddenly, the entire system breaks down simply because we, we don't know what, what, the, what the state of the transaction is and we don't have the means to recover from it. So that's uh, front and back end split. Um, the other part is split out entity ownership service because even though it's built on, on shard uh, as, the, as the back end thing, there, there is a, a semi-well-defined uh, interface of what that entity ownership service really does. And it, it turns out it just uses Raft plus the data store thingies. And uh, we already have, um, I think, two issues, uh, two corner cases where, where it doesn't really behave that well. And just fleshing those out will give us um, the means to, to actually fix those things. The, one of them is cleaning up entities when they no longer have any candidates. Uh, that was brought up by the OVSDB folk. And the other part is when you uh, force a split brain in a cluster and essentially the, the, the leader is in the minority partition. That, that's when, when you actually can see two leaders if you're a, an external device. So, so those two things we will be definitely fixing in, in Boron and we'll see whether we can back, backport that to Beryllium. Um, and the third part, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, maybe you make the edge change for that. I don't know if it's good, but I won't. Use the mic. Well, um, is that? Use the mic. Is there a hand mic? Yes. Um, ooh, ooh. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So the any owners. So the other, another thing is that maybe. Uh, I, I mean, you done with? You have more. I, one, two, three to go. Oh, sure. I, I mean, we can add things. I mean, it's just rolling okay, up what, 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 what uh, we were thinking. So we added a new um, sh um, entity ownership uh, API in um, just the interfaces. Yep. So uh, primarily to, uh, to add a binding interface for it. So, um, so you don't have to go. So if your application is talking binding and you want to use generic, the generic entity instead of your own entity, you don't have to. Um, no, actually, either way, they have to pass the Yang instance identifier. So yeah, so yeah. currently applications, if they're binding aware, they have to get a hold of that codec thingy to translate yep. it to a Yang instance identifier, which is kind of a pain. So, um, uh, so yeah, so we want to, um, so that so we, we put out a new interface here, so we have to implement that. I've actually pushed some patches or drafts yep. right now to, uh, I've changed the uh, distributed any ownership servers to implement that new interface. Yep. So, uh, and, and I've gotten the, the adapter to the old interface. So right. you can deprecate the old interface. Yeah. The binding thing's a little, uh, 
I started doing that and I realized uh, we don't, we're not creating one of those <coughs> binding normalized codex yet from the MD Sal <laughs> yeah. um, project. So there hasn't, we're not using anything from that quite yet. Yeah. So need, need a little groundbreaking there. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be. Anyway, so uh, but yeah, so there, were, there is a new interface for that. And I think uh, the new interface will make it easier for us to add new, uh, I think better defined states for the ownership changes, you know. Instead of just has owner, is owner, was owner, um, I, they're enums now. So with those flags, but they're enums. So I think yeah. we can do more with it as far as uh, so as far as this problem and and you know other things. <coughs> and there is there is actually one more thing that is more of a feature request that I'm I'm not sure whether we should be doing it or not. Is essentially the the ability to do a stateful failover. In, uh, in entities, because typically what, what you, you have is, and this has come up with, with OpenFlow plugin, is that um, you have an entity representing a switch. And um, so, so you have two nodes competing for that switch, they have a TCP session going on there, something goes wrong, and suddenly the switch um, changes the, the mastership role I'm not sure what the exact flow is, but essentially what it ends up doing is that it takes away uh, ownership from, from the old, old master and gives it to, to the new one. But the problem is that, that the, the old master has still a transaction chain which has not been completely flushed. So, so it kind of needs to hold, hold back and, and those two need to coordinate on uh, essentially owning the data store state. So, so the way it's been done um, in beryllium is that you actually get two entities per switch uh, where one represents the, the, the session and the other one represents the, uh, the data store state. And when, when a, a, a node acquires um, the ownership of a TCP session, it's going to register as a candidate uh, for, for the data store thing. But um, it will not take ownership until it's released from the other side. So, we can do the, this either this kind of two entities thing, or provide some sort of API to to do a uh, asynchronous transition. Because obviously you want to flush out all, all that the the old master has been uh, has seen, so you don't have to run the stats, <coughs> the discovery, all of that again, and wipe the data store and then repopulate it. So um, that uh, there there is an actually an enhancement file for that. Um, yeah, so so we'll see about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so, go ahead. Uh, how is the current uh, leader election mechanism work with uh, Alka or? Uh, so, I, I think uh, Tom, Tom is <laughs> much more um, fluent in this, but essentially what it does, it, it runs um, uh, the, the raft algorithm just as the data store does. Um, so, there's keep alive going on. Uh, so, and there was a question on, 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 on the mailing list just today, I think. Um, and so, so the, the individual um, candidates are, are doing um, um, heartbeats um, to, to, to see, see whether they, they still see each other. And should a, a cluster split occur, so we, we don't see the old, old um, owner, we're, we're going to force a raft election. And then out of that election, a new leader or other new owner emerges, at which point we propagate it to, to the user. Um, actually, we were already doing that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to flip this and start drawing things, right? <laughs> yeah. So we have, by my calculation, 32 minutes left. And I would suggest that we go through quickly the list of. Yeah. based on one to rip their teeth out by the sockets during the building clustering application, because I suspect there are things. Um, and, and then we can dive into the sort of really deep angular details. But that's just okay. Um, so we'll table that, but we'll come, come back to that. Essentially, it's built on top of Akka, where we have a raft implementation, and then both shard and entity ownership service. And 
I don't know what else uh, is built on top of that. And then the, the final bit that we need to break out is the, um, I think it's called shard admin or thereabout. That's the interface shard manager. <coughs> Well, we have, yeah, we have shard manager. And we got some, this cluster admin. Cluster admin. Yeah, that, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. Cluster admin, which again is not tied to the data store itself. It's kind of a management application. And if we do this, we can, we can, we'll have a modular code base. So if you're, if you're debugging something, you, you don't have to open the entire project and go hunting what's going on, but can, can focus on well, these are the APIs I'm, I'm using. Um, that's it. And then the third part, and this is kind of, kind of contentious because I originally planned to kind of push forward the, the ACA type thing, uh, which as it turns out is not ready in ACA, uh, at least not uh, for use in Java. But uh, essentially what, what, we're, what, what we need to, to make sure is kind of decouple our business logic from the actor system so that we can um, use uh, synchronous unit tests and understand the, the state of the, the the behavior really and whether the behavior works. So I would say that that we so we already have this in Salah Craft. So all, all of that is decoupled. You get an actor context uh, with your behavior and the behaviors are switching just as, as they would with with Salah Craft. Uh, we kind of need to do this for for the the entire data store because there's. Um, essentially, the shard is a dispatch of I, I don't know 30 messages, and it's not, not not all of those messages are valid all the time. Some are valid only for uh, for when when the the particular shard instance is, is a leader, and we kind of need to, to to decouple that. And on the unit test side, that will give us behaviors which are not tied in, uh, intimately to the actor system, and allow us to to kind of do just synchronous unit tests. Get, get the behavior and see whether it sends out the right messages. Now on the behaviors, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Yep. Uh, okay, so so if somebody commits to doing it, um, yeah, it's it's something to to be picked up. Um, I honestly don't know if if I'll get to that because there's other interesting things and that, that need yeah, to get picked. Priority, yeah. yeah. But it's experimental too, from my right? Yeah. So so, so if. So, so, so the thing is, even if we break it up into our our custom behaviors, the way we are doing Sala Karaft, then once it becomes um, non-experimental, it's going to be a, a minor shift in, in, in the way the, the code is organized. And since we are doing it in one component, it does make sense to do it, follow the same pattern in, in, in other components too. Okay. Uh, what, what's for? Um, four. Four is something um, end user friendly because, as it turns out, a lot Sweet. of yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as it turns out, um, uh, usually if you write an application, you don't want to be running it on all, on all the nodes and deal with distributed state and what have you. What what you want to do is build your application, make sure you have um, normal HA going on, right? So, so if, if a node goes down, all you really need to do is just wipe the state in the data store, whatever you've written, whatever the, the runtime state was, and bring that application up in, on another node. That's all you want to do. And as it, as it turns out, this is really hard to do today because you essentially have to wire it into config subsystem, then you need to wire it into entity ownership service, um, then you need to listen for entity um, uh, ownership changes and kind of manage all those transition, uh, uh, transitions yourself. Whereas if you had a component to which you would tell that, okay, this bundle essentially, or this module, or it doesn't matter what, what wiring we'll use, and that's the config stuff, um, 
really wants to be a cluster-wide singleton. So I really want to have only one instance of, of this guy running in the entire cluster. Um, then it would be much easier, right? And that really should be the default because until you get into, okay, I need to have a distributed uh, application, you don't want to be dealing with the details. So that's what number four is. Um, and it's well, called, yeah. yeah. So we started with any of the ownership servers. That was the first kind of basic primitive to do this. So, right. So now expanding on that and making it a little bit simpler. Yeah. To, to wrap. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how loud do I need to? Yeah. Yeah. So, we're being recorded, so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No yeah. Being yeah, so are your comments, Colin, by the way. My comments are usually heckling you, heckling Tom, telling you the next number. So, I think we're okay. You're all loud. Yeah. And I think there's a reasonable chance your mic is picking me up. Yes, yeah, that's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> Yep. Right. Um, and so there's a series of these that seem like they'd be useful. There's probably four or five. Um, but cluster wide singleton sounds like the right one to start with. Yep. Because that's essentially what BGP not needs. Well, BGP needs a lot more, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is, a, this is the common pattern. Um, it's gonna, going to be built on top of entity ownership service because it doesn't matter to, uh, it doesn't make sense to, to, to build all the infrastructure again. But. So <laughs> so, are we? Do people here have any question that they're like burning to ask that they've been sitting on waiting? Because we only have like yeah, we have twenty five minutes left, and I and like like Moyes and Robert and Tom and I can yell at each other on WebEx like we do. <laughs> <laughs> but there aren't it's not the same, Colin. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, uh, this regarding this, um, um, you know, shard leader and followers. Now, uh, if the configuration from the north comes into the follower and there are lots of message exchanges, uh, even though say the switch is connected to the follower, right? I mean, uh, essentially, I mean, say, I mean, yeah. uh, open for example. Is there any way to reduce this number of transactions? I mean, is there any plans to do this? Like in the sense, the leader node itself can perhaps go down and program the switch uh, even before, probably this is a kind of paradigm shift for the cluster uh, you know, uh, shard design, but then it does result in lots of back and forth messages. We've seen the, that thus, you know, as you scale out. Yeah, so, uh, so, so that would be essentially number five and it's kind of, kind of uh, fuzzy. Um, and the thing is, uh, the lithium of open flow design is centered around the idea that you have a single transaction chain per switch. Now, um, the reason why it's designed that way is that because uh, we do have a programmatic way of adding shards, we don't have a programmatic, a programmatic way of moving the shard leader around, but um, what, what we can do is essentially, since you have a shard per switch, we can make sure that the shard leader is co-located with the, the master session, and then you obviously are going to uh, replicate things around just, be, just so that the, the, uh, whenever failover happens, you don't have to collect statistics and what have you. But the ability to, to essentially move the shard leader to make sure it's co-located with whoever is doing the writes into the data store, yes, th that is an, an item that we want to tackle. And it, it's already designed and we're kind of converging on, on well, not, not sharding only on modules, uh, but on actual paths. Um, and, and making that transparent to, say, RESTConf, but allowing the applications to, to do this. So, so, thank you. Five? Five? so five yeah. Um, um, is, that's five, actually. 
And that, that actually is part of MDSAL uh, APIs first, and then we kind of need to plug in into that. It, it's a... Um, yeah, yeah, I'd like to get an understanding. I'm not so what was, what was the question? Because the question was about lost packets or something like that. And I'm no, it's, no it's, it's, a, it's, about, it, it's about messages going on. So, so if you have a, a open flow in a redundant configuration, and your master session for, for that particular open, open flow switch is not co-located with the shard leader, then you will end up with all the, the remote stuff going on, which is, is going to take toll on, well, CPU cycles, network, and what have you. Whereas if you could move the shard leader to be co-located with, with that writer, you get the, 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 the local bypass, and then you're just sending out replicating uh, transactions, which, again, are state compressed using ping pong transaction chains, what have you. Um, what do you mean reliable? Well, so, so the question was, uh, are remote RPCs reliable? Um, yes, they are in that their failure modes are well defined. Uh, I'm not sure what, how reliable do you want to make them? No, no, so my, my question is, are you going to see a radically different behavior when you move from making local RPCs to remote RPCs in terms of the increase in, in failures of certain kind and thus break applications that weren't handling that for um, I honestly. And my answer would be almost certainly yes, unless we designed it not to do that. But I, I'd love to be wrong. So I'm, I'm not sure how, how the implementation of the RPC router looks like. But. Because, but. Because but RPC uses gossip. So it yep. might take, like, it, I think the message is exchanged every 500 milliseconds. So it might take more time for all of those routes to get exchanged across the network. Yeah, so that might be a problem. timing issues with that. So, and then hence I pushed the patch to. Uh, Try. I, uh, I think, uh, uh, I, I, I think this is a question more uh, to Moise and uh, um, to Tom. Uh, I, th I think uh, the OpenFlow plugin uh, has changed to use, uh, at least for the, the Helium design, actually, uh, to use the local RPCs for and uh, the FRM uh, for this. Um, yeah, is that right? That issue. Yeah, because. So, uh, <laughs> first push a patch to uh, work around it. So, but I also push past to kind of do weights and retries to uh, full point in the uh, It was because of that, the gossip had to yep. yeah. And it had to gossip the route. Right? Yeah, yeah, so. so, so that makes more sense because what, I think what you're talking about is using cluster data tree listener on each node and yeah. using that to program the flows. Right? I think that's Something what like you did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think I think that's a better pattern than even using remote RPCs. Maybe yeah. RPCs, I don't see RPCs as a good way to. So, does so, does so, 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 so delivering, so, so delivering uh, data change notifications to the local node and then just issuing local RPCs on that particular node. Yes, because it gives you reliable transport. Uh, which you don't have with gossip. Then again, um, the idea of routed RPCs and, and um, how, how it was envisioned, I guess, in, in MD Sal was that you essentially have routers. So, so you have a DOM RPC router, for example, and it has the notion of what RPCs are, are registered locally, and then it has a bunch of peers who registered their their view. So, so from MD cell perspective, this could be made reliable, right? Because uh, if we don't use gossip for for transport, but rather transport it somehow uh, somehow differently, and th that's a question of whether we want to keep um, two essentially messaging infrastructures un underneath our cluster-wide services. Um, and if we use the, the same mechanism that we use for data store, which is based on TCP, then we don't get lost packets, and then the RPCs are reliable and, and, and they kind of work. And they're designed to, to be reliable on the MDSAL layer, not on the transport layer, because that's an implementation issue. Um, yeah, there was a question from you. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I got it. Here you go. <laughs> Less technical in, in nature. Um, just. I've heard suggestion that maybe we should split out clustering from controller. I'm just wondering whether that's part of this discussion or that's maybe separate. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, having gone through splitting things out of projects, 
Um, the question is, do we want to get anything else done or do we want to focus on this? I mean, I think everybody agrees that there were six projects inside of the controller um, and we killed one of them and factored two of them out in Beryllium and we did it. <laughs> That's We're about the strongest statement I can make about, about what happened. Um, so, so I think there are lots of people that would be in favor of it, but the question would be, is it worth the cost? Um, and I don't know. I, and, and given that I think Robert was the strongest advocate of factoring out <laughs> before, you should take his um, hesitance as indicative of lessons learned. So, so, so splitting up NetConf and MDSAL out of Yank tools and controller um, took Tony somewhere around eight weeks to do with all the, all the backwards compatibility and ensuring that anything, uh, nothing breaks. Doing that, um, I'm kind of wary. Um, we, we've got a lot of things to do which are immediately useful and immediately needed. Uh, while um, moving code, uh, code around from, from project really just gives us essentially governance and I, I guess dependencies, but nobody cares about being dependent on, on controller these days. So um, I would probably levitate more to, to just leave controller as is, we are down to actually four projects in, in the controller right now. Uh, we can understand what they are. Uh, one of them is Frozen, which is the config subsystem. Uh, we've got the distributed data store and the clustering services. Uh, we've got the, um, the Caraf infra infrastructure, so Caraf empty and what have you, uh, which we were discussing about taking it to, to the ODL parent, which should be an easy migration, actually. Um, and the fourth one is obviously the toaster. You always forget this toaster. <laughs> oh, the archetypes are still there. Oh, they need to go. Right, but but the binding APIs have already been been, been moved to MD Sol, and it's just a matter of adjusting all the users to to new to new, new the, uh, to use the new new ones. Yeah, but so, so so yes, we want to. Maybe we won't. Um, more questions. Um, um, is there a plan to uh, support different roles and different uh, leaders for each role? Um, different charting. Oh, yeah. For the application to uh, yeah, so so we currently have shards per module, so like per Yang module you define, not her augmentation. If you augment into it, it goes into the shard for the original module. And so, for instance, like now the the really frustrating part of that is that almost everything interesting in Open Daylight hangs off of topology, um, and so which is how it should be. Uh, <laughs> Yes, but it shouldn't all be in one shard. And so the result is in practice right now, we have one giant shard that is topology, which stores almost everything. And so if you want to get reasonable application behavior that's sharded out, you can sort of create your own off to the side cache of information in like, you know, my app module and then copy it back and forth in and out of topology. So that way you only have to, so that way you can do your leader and then, but topology still has one leader, which is a bottleneck and probably shouldn't be there. Although figuring out how to manage one logical shard that's, you know, gets all the transactions in open daylight, that's a, an interesting problem for future work. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So some of that work. Um, yeah, 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 so. Queries, I'm concerned about the fact that right now when we want to query on a list especially, we have to get the whole list. And that's a problem, right? We, do, we cannot do any queries where we provide a filter and say, get me all the items which match this particular, uh, like, you know, this value. Yeah, this is my, this is my favorite. What, what would be the query language? The query, I mean, again, the thing is... I can so, so, so the thing is, we need to define the API for that. No, no, you, you pass to read, you pass an object, which would be a query. Um, and I'm not saying, uh, let's come up with a fancy language or anything. Just say, you know, like uh, attribute match, like exact match maybe. Yeah, I think it's orthogonal to, I know what you're saying, list reads are more expensive. We have to yep. aggregate, and that's the biggest problem. 
with so, uh, so 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 the question in, in my mind on, on this is whether whether we do do a pull or push push based model because if if you say uh, we need filters on reads that means essentially that we uh, we have to execute i don't know where where i put the black marker sorry right but but if, so, so right but but in or, but but in order to execute that efficiently we need to pass it down to the data tree. And uh, at that point, uh, what, what you will see is, that, so, so the data tree executes on, on binding independent, uh, um, essentially a tree-like structure. So if we do the, uh, well, just give me an object which will, which will have the, the query filter, that object will, will suddenly have to deal with binding independent nodes. And, and that is not quite friendly because all the applications are binding aware. They, d they don't know what the layout of the normalized nodes are. They don't know all the rules uh, that go into it. And they are inherently quite different. So, so was the net net of that is basically querying, getting data out of the MD cell in addition to putting transactions in is going to be complicated as, as things get bigger and we need to figure out ways to make it efficient. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's, more questions. Yeah, sure. Um, ODSQL. You mean XSQL? Yeah. Um, so the current implementation is two layers above where it needs to go. So it's not really schema aware. It doesn't talk to the data tree. So, and, and at that, that point, uh, essentially your query, query language is SQL, which is not really, um, uh, aligned with well XML structures, so uh, I think a better fit for for this would be XQuery, or really some, sometimes you just want to do an XPath query or an X query, and we do have that under OpenMap for Yank tools. It got le left out of Beryllium because we just couldn't do it. Um, so yeah, doing that is possible. We just need to to agree what the um, oh thank you for being described. Um, So, so, and, and we really need to understand the, square, uh, the structure of the que query to, to make sure we don't op, uh, execute it every time the, uh, that particular list or, or really anything in the data tree changes because that will not perform. We already know that. Um, and as for replicating things, so essentially um, what we can do right now is essentially you, you can hang off a data, uh, data tree change listener and execute that, that query as the, the, the data is being pushed to you. It's not efficient, but it's doable. And, it's, um, and it doesn't have to go into the infrastructure. It can be done as a utility application. So, so one more issue uh, yep. So data tree change listeners are essentially built on top of the way the data tree operates. And data tree is a tree. So, so it's a layered tree uh, which, which maps onto essentially what your Yang looks like. Um, and as you're doing modifications, if you write something to a list or do whatever you do, there is a three-phase commit um, ki kind of thingy built into data tree when after, after having prepared the transaction, you essentially see and you have a, a navigable tree-like structure which gives you a reflection of what has changed in, in the data tree. And it's a, a tree form. Uh, you get that for free out, out of the data tree. So, so it's a byproduct of, of applying that, that modification. Now, when you go to data store, which uses the data tree internally, it, take this, it takes this structure and it walks it from the root and it has an, another tree-like structure, which are the, the listener registrations, which are each keyed off of, of a particular instance identifier, or a wildcard, at which point it got, does wildcard expansion, but that's just a, well, relatively simple thing to do. And if, if it sees um, a modification on the corresponding tree, it just, well, fires off a data change modification. So, so it's essentially co-walking two trees and, and making connection between the two. And this turns out it's pretty efficient. Yeah. Can we have... Are, are those listeners all running on the, the meter chart? 
Um, currently, yes, but <laughs> it, they, they, they don't have to. So the way, the way listeners get triggered, uh, let's come back to that. Yeah. yeah. So, so that, that's a question about push and pull. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, just a sec. There was a question right over here. Yeah. So, um, right. Uh, yeah. This is. Of course you can. And and the thing is, if you if you are doing um, push based access to 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 the data store, so if you're using data change notifications. Um, it is it is left undefined where where that happens, so it can easily be moved um, to a follower. At which point, if you register to to receive notifications, uh, the followers are uh, entangled with the leader because of the raft algorithm. So they're strongly consistent with with the view that the leader sees. There's no reason that the leader needs to do that. Uh, the, the followers can do it just as well, and there's no new APIs required on applications. It's just an implementation issue. So yeah, yeah. Uh, do we have a plan for supporting transaction retries for f uh, for any failures, like yeah. the last time out? So, so we. Uh, yeah, on the first page. Or um, okay, so the actually, no, because front and back end separation takes care of it. Um, yeah. So. So it's a in-depth topic. We, we've been talking with, with Tom. We kind of need to go back and design the, the front and back end APIs. As I said, uh, we need to split them out. Because um, recovering from ask timeouts is possible. But currently, we don't have enough information, and reliable information, and the APIs to, to kind of restart the transaction or um, uh, re retry talking to the shard leader to ask what the, the state of the transaction is. It's, it's not a failure in, in the sense that there's a data dependency error Correct. or whatever. Uh, we cannot recover those, but we can do something about those ask timeouts. So outs. you plan to provide an infrastructure to retry, or would you ask applications um, to that, that would actually, um, my view on that is that it would be hidden in the data store front end. Okay. So when, whenever this happens, um, the, the, the front end will internally retry, retry. because, because the, the end user API is just a future, right? Correct. It, it, it doesn't matter whether it's going to take an hour if it needs to. Sure. Um, so, so the, the front end code is free to retry and can kind of reconcile that, that the, the state of the transaction and really the data tree underneath it, uh, with the leader and with the available knowledge. So yes, we can do that and applications know they don't have to care about this. Okay. And one more question. Oh, if it's if it's a if it's a hard failure, the applications have to sue it, yeah. right? So, so, so you can retry your application right now because sorry, uh, no problem. There, you can't you can retry because we actually throw a specific data store unavailable. Is it unavailable exception? So, which theoretically you could use to retry in your app. But we would like to make it more resilient, though, in terms of leadership changes and so a node goes down, um, you know, the leader goes down. Le the leader of the shard, you take it down gracefully. So actually in Beryllium, we added the um, le leadership transfer. So that's a graceful, immediate yeah. transfer. We don't get that 10 second, you know, loss of a uh, while at Realex. But if you lose connectivity, you're, you get network partition, which and those things happen. Um, we're not very resilient to that right now. As far as retrying, so, so this is where you get ask timeouts. The other thing is, if the shard gets busy, <laughs> which is a whole other um, data change notification, we've seen it get backed up for like 10, 20 seconds, and and now you start to, well, you saw it, you're testing, so, 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 so you guys the, saw The thing it. is, don't use, oh, which, yeah, yeah, which is actually another, another topic. For, we, forget we, there are data change notifications, please. That yes. is something that needs to die because it's computationally Depre intensive. We, we're going to deprecate it. We are officially yes, yes. going to deprecate it. We forgot to do that in Beryllium, unfortunately. <laughs> right. But it will, it, it is data, tree, data change listener will be deprecated. In your applications, mm. if you're using it for any heavy lifting, Don't. please move off of it. <laughs> if, if you're listening on a, on a, on a uh, very heavy um, traffic list, Yang list, 
Please use data tree change <laughs> notifications. No, no, please, please do um, use data tree change listeners so, for everything, for everything, please. Because they especially Yang list though. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so the thing is with that yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take that and I'll move this mic. Okay. And one more question is uh, do Boron guarantee all applications to be cluster aware? Because in Beryllium it was an optional. So are we still with that stance in Boron? So that comes back to the, the previous one. I think that goes to both. And, and the, so, so what, what does... From the TSE's perspective, because I think it's the only, the only organization that can actually say that. So we can't... I don't think... I don't, I don't think we're in a position to mandate that everybody do it. I think that we could, if we make it so that way, everybody does... So by gets it for free effectively, and we convince people that it's worth doing that, which we've had success with in the past, then we could probably get it. But that would involve sort of us meeting them 90% of the way, which is where I think the singleton might come in, which is where if you basically give people a world in which it behaves as though their application was written, maybe we can do it. Um, that being said, I do think we didn't get to having stable features in Beryllium. Um, I think that to be a stable feature, which I would like to see us have in Boron, I would like the requirement, as it was stated in the Beryllium release plan, but never got enforced because there were none of them, that, that all stable features be tested in a cluster and actually work. And so that way we can at least start segregating features by, I mean, we're not going to stop people from coming in and doing something fun and interesting and new that isn't HA because there's no reason to stop them. We've built, spent a long time building our infrastructure to basically make it easy for people to bring cool stuff. But at the same time, we want to be able to make it clear to end users when things are going to work and when they're not. <laughs> and we've done a really terrible job of that. Right, and I wanted to touch on, on that cluster unavailable exception. The problem with that is you really don't know what the state is. Because if the, the leader is just busy while well, committing the transaction, the only, the only avenue of recovery for application is just to wipe the entire thing off and start off with clean slate, which if it's, be, uh, if it's due to, well, congestion, will end up not doing any progress at all because, well, sudden, eventually your working, your working set is still the same. So some, sometime down the road you will en encounter the same situation and you will again throw it all, all away and build it up. So that's what we need to um, make sure that doesn't happen and we recover. And we understand that the transaction is still going on. That change, I think transaction change is from monkey wrench and things to try to retry. Um, uh, Stay, you, you were mentioning yeah, so. this too. I, um, yeah. Especially with, um, like if we, if we get all the way to the can commit phase and say we're going multiple shards, you know, we, we shortcut it for Okay, shard. another note, another note. Please don't do ever, ever transactions that cross multiple shards. Yeah, try to not do Please, please, please don't. Um, a note, um, the cluster-wide consistency of such transactions is not completely guaranteed. It works most, most of the time, but if things go south during that transaction, you may actually end up seeing inconsistent data in your data store. Please, please, please only t ever talk to a single shard at a time. <laughs> Yeah, How it, do you figure it, that out if we have fine-grained charting? Um, so, so that's why the applications get to say and, well, so, so what, um, what I've seen in applications usually is that you have a constrained set of things that you write to and um, usually you can kind of, kind of ensure that it's a say, same subtree. Usually. If, if, if you can do that, then it's, it's probably... Um, no, 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 no. So the, pro the problem is, okay. it's a microphone. And I don't know how to solve this. So the problem is, and I have no idea, and, and there, there isn't a good solution. There is just, there is just pain. Um, is uh, your either your application has to be written in a way that it is parses and understands the shard configuration, so that way it intentionally avoids writing across shards, or your application has to be written to a static way to, of shards, and then it's not going to be tolerant to shard changes. So, you, so then when the config of how your shards are laid out changes, your application breaks. It doesn't necessarily break, but 
but gets different consistency guarantees that it was, it was expecting, or you have to have one giant shard. And there's sort of, there is no free lunch. You either like make application developers hate their lives, you have static fly it out sharding, so that way you don't break applications, or you break applications. Um, and um, like, okay, so on that, um, I, I think we've championed the microservice architecture here. So yes, break applications apart. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense to, to do everything plus a kitchen th sink in a single thread uh, and do a million things in a single application because it doesn't give you reusability. Everybody is going to do the same things over and over again. And what, what we've seen, if, if we create utilities which perform, perform a single function and do it well, then you can hand off this, this processing between those the, those points across the data store, and, and you don't have a problem of, of mega shards, and you kind of get a well-defined API between your um, uh, microservices, and you can spread them around in the cluster or whatever S makes sense. So what I think you said is that there is, should be a single logical writer per subtree. Exactly. Okay, which is which is a, a solution, a, a programming paradigm, which would give you a solution to that problem. There's a whole topic for that. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen the topics, <laughs> but yeah, I can talk talk about it a lot. No, I mean, I think there's a whole topic. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, actually, the multi-writer is talking to OpenFlow switches and and, and ensuring access. That's something else. Though. Yeah, that, that's yeah, that, that's sorry. oh, that's OpenFlow specific. It's not all data right, store. I, was I thought that had to do with. So, yeah. there, so there's been too much. <laughs> um, Ed. <laughs> no, no, uh, Colin pointed out there there was a lot of talking from the front of the room, so yeah, so I just picked you to, to talk some more from that. You're welcome. <laughs> also, I'd like to point out that technically we're on break as of five minutes ago, but oh. Um, high availability infrastructure can be taken out of ODL uh, cleanly or it is baked into the core infrastructure? So it depends on which part of HA you, you, you think about because um, essentially what, what you can do is externalize service, um, service instantiation and service activation. Um, through the config subsystem, you can talk to the to the to the RESTCOM interface and ensure that that particular no, nodes activate a particular service, and then to, that way you can have uh, essentially your HA daemon and, and your supervision outside of Open Daylight. Um, but uh, I think we we want to also build something into Open Daylight itself. Uh, so the question is. I mean, suppose I have high availability outside ODL, uh, then I don't need it in ODL. Um, sure. I mean, if you if you if you can do something like um, I don't know Kubernetes or any anything of that kind, where you treat the entire Open Daylight instance as a as an application, then yes, you, you can do the entire failovers of, of the entire thing. And you don't actually need clustering to do that. At that point, you treat it as a single instance application and move it around. Um, the downside of that is if it gets corrupted, you, well, if it gets, gets corrupted, you're, you're, you're done anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's a, but but that's pure HA. I mean, it's failover, and um, a lot of well applications don't don't need anything else. So yeah, in in that particular case, we, when you just want to make sure that an application is available and you can tolerate moving, I don't know, VM or or the processing around using an external tool, no, you don't need cl clustering from Open Daylight to 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 make that work. Uh, so it can be taken out cleanly using Graph. Um, so you just, you're the config file, and by default, it's just a single node. Oh. Yeah, so, so, so if you just deploy Open Daylight, it's just single node, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that, that's where, where the fun starts.
Uh, two questions. One, uh, config subsystem, what about a cluster-aware config subsystem, like a Zookeeper-like equivalent? Where do I maintain my configuration data that's cluster-wide? Um, in, the, in the configuration data store, please. <laughs> but, I mean, like, I w I'm currently using config subsystem. I'm migrating yep. it to a cluster-aware application. Why should I change it? Um, you no, no, all so, I'm saying is the underlying config subsystem should take care of it. It could be... So, so, so the thing is, MDSOL gives you, gives you or, or rather takes care of the data. It doesn't take care of service injection and service activation itself. Um, what we currently have, for example, with NetConf is that you don't have the, the configuration in uh, config XMLs. Um, in config XMLs, all you do is essentially activate an, an, a, an agent on, on each node. Uh, you write the configuration in the configuration data store. Um, those agents run entity ownership service, and we've got Tomas who, who's done all, all of that. Um, and one of them becomes the master and applies the configuration and, and instantiates all, all of those connections. Actually, it's done on each node. So your configuration of that service is in the configuration database. The, the service wiring is still done in, in config, but um, the application itself is quote unquote cluster aware to the point it doesn't activate all the way in on all nodes, but rather cooperates to, to ensure that, well, sanity. Uh, across. Um, I think this is a block to your question about config and upgrades and all that. Essentially what we need is, as Colin was saying, uh, patterns on how, how to activate applications and how to do service injection. Um, I'm not sure whether distributed OSGI is the, the way to go, um, but it, it, it is kind of <laughs> kind of um, that, that area of, of problems. How do you inject services into other services. I'll just add my personal opinion because I'm never shy, but I'll keep, so I'll add my personal opinion, I'm not shy, but tell me if I'm wrong, but you're gonna need two different places, you probably want two different places to store data. You probably want a node local place to store, to store information because there are some things that you don't want to be cluster wide. Um, like you really do want to understand that there is something different about you from everybody else. And you know, I think if anybody's ever written a forking application, just the PID as an index to start off of that is often awkward. Um, and so you also want something which is cluster wide. And so in some sense we have that, which is we have config files, which are by definition local to the node. And you should just only put things in them that you want to be local to the node. And we have a MD cell data store, which is clustered, which will give you cluster wide storage. And the fact that we got into that design by total accident, um, um, we can it, no, it's not a, no accident. Sorry, <laughs> there's no accidents here. <laughs> given given the number of discussions that I've heard about making config system cluster aware, we may have intentionally not done it. But uh, um, no, so so the idea, and this goes way before even Open Daylight started, because config subsystem got contributed. Um, the idea was that um, essentially, when you're bringing up a cluster. Essentially, what you're doing is bringing up in individual nodes, which then form a cluster. So, com config subsystem was designed and implemented to act as a single node solution, um, with the idea that once we have clustering and we we have dynamic nodes and all that, there there will be a component which will talk to the to, to, to the local config subsystem agent and tell it. Um, from the cluster-wide perspective, what services it needs to activate. At which point, uh, you would have things that come up by default on each node, and things that only get activated when told to by some uh, cluster-wide um, entity, which all does all the figuring out what needs to go there, where, possibly taking loads into account, all, all that kind of, kind of interesting stuff. That, that never got built. Because, yeah, I guess, well, uh, I mean, if it's only about service activation, it being local makes sense. I would just say, for example, OpenFlow plugin, I want to change the port it listens on. I have to change it on all the cluster nodes now, or I have to change the OpenFlow plugin to store, start storing that information in the MD cell data. Um, right, so, so the idea was that um, you would just express the wiring for OpenFlow plugin in, in config, config subsystem. Your node comes up, essentially bringing up just the cluster, uh, uh, cluster information, you wouldn't have that current XML config at all, or rather it would only only have, and that's why it exists, it's not tied into, but it's externally 
um, uh, persisted. That's why it's not internally persisted. So essentially you would have a, a bring up configuration which is persisted on the local node. And once that is brought up, then from somewhere else, probably from maybe from the config data store or from, from some other external means, you bring in the configuration which should be effective at that particular node at that particular time for whatever reasons. So, so that, that was the thinking be, be behind the design and implementation of what we okay. have, have now. That high level never occurred for, well, okay. reasons why, well, there's a lot of um, things to do. <laughs> second. A little bit, right? Using, so Caraf has config admin, right? CFG files. There is, what, what is it called? Ceiling? I have never used it. Uh, they have a they way of distributing. Yeah. Seller. Seller. <laughs> Seller. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. But I've never used. I've never even. You've looked into it. I've never yeah, looked into it. Yeah. It's. And anyway, but I just. Yeah. I don't Second. know if that's. Um, the, the core problem of, of this is that it's, well, key value. And key value is not good enough for a lot of applications. Because essentially what you end up is um, coming up with um, custom string formats and you don't really have any model of, of our configuration data. Because, well, suddenly um, this magic string which contains a fully qualified class name um, a, a comma and a string which has to be a long. Um, <laughs> I don't, yeah, yeah. I, I just found out this, this weekend. Yeah. I, <laughs> so, so, so suddenly the, the, the format of the, that string is not expressed anywhere in any way that, that our infrastructure can, can, can deal with. And we've got the Yang. We could, we could be modeling this as a proper, well, this is the class, this is the delay, what have you. It's a rich structure. It's not a key and a value. It's a rich subtree. And anything that you can come up, come across uh, for configuration in OSGI environments is always property driven and it's key value always. No, no structures, no nothing. So, well, what what do you I know it's yes, problem. Jason en encoded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but, okay, then you get structure for your values. You still don't get structure for your keys. And the relationship between keys, you cannot do that. So. I don't know whether defining a schema for every possible thing. It is important. It is very important. No, it's not user friendly, though. That's all I would say. Um, it it is not developer friendly. It is user friendly as, as soon as you get into in integrating network elements in a real network. Because, and we've got people who deal with broken net, uh, netconf routers which don't model the, their, uh, they, 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 uh, their they data model. And suddenly we don't have visibility into that structure. Let's not do that. Well, dot data store dot shard exactly. name dot all yeah. yep. special stuff. Plus, mostly with the updates. Yeah. Preserving rules and changes. Right, but but so so the thing is, going from um, a config yang file to a config data store yang file plus whatever we decide to do for service activation is much easier than going into the code, figuring what the strings are, what the format is, what what the rules are, and, and migrating it that way. No, no, yeah. That's specifically meant not like so that people don't actually change it. That's what that's the reason why it was created. I mean, <laughs> you haven't gone into the history of it. It's I know. only people who know what they're doing to actually do it. Right, but but at that point oh, there, there is so 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 those people cannot cannot use netconf to do that. They have to go uh, use their favorite editor and uh, and or talk to the config admin service in Karaf and and push it that way. Suddenly, 
if, if I have a, a network management system into which Open Daylight instance is plugged, there's, there's no interface uh, that, or, or rather there is interface, but it's not, not netconf. It's not netconf. It's not, Rest. Rest. well, as, as long as you, you have the, the loopback or what, well, and if you have a oh, Jolokia, actually, actually, you have to have Jolokia deployed, and then you suddenly have two, two channels to the same network element, because some things you can do with netconf, the others you have to go through uh, Jolokia, and suddenly you have uh, two endpoints, if you, and if you're doing orchestration, and for some reason your management plane firewalling doesn't work, and you can access one of those channels and cannot access the, the second one, you're in world of operational problems. So um, having a single management point for, for open daylight and to be able to change essentially any, any part which is reasonable to, to modify in, in a deployment through that single means is very important. Yep, uh, that's uh, that's the one. Have more uh, conversations on uh, the queries and uh, and what was the other thing? Okay. The fine grain shot. Uh, yeah, the uh, fine grain shot. I think we yeah. have more conversations. Yeah, can we overflow or can we take a break or really break it out or? Sloppy. It's, it's already reliable. Um so well the clustering group tends to look on controller dev and and or MD Sol dev depends on the area. And the clustering call is Tuesdays at 8 a.m. PST, which makes it 5 p.m. Central European time, and well, you can do the time zones from there. Okay. And where do you go to find that if we forget? Um, it's on it's on a wiki. Just search for MD Sol clustering, and it's I think third hit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's why I always search. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, um, but it's not directly off of that. Yeah. Where do we get this stuff directly off of that? So I, I yeah, Colin, you've been in the middle of that wiki thing. Do you, do you have, so you, can you pound info? So if you go to, <laughs> if you go to the wiki.org and then you go to per project meetings, then I'll say this out loud, you can see the wiki.org. So if you go to wiki.opendaylight.org and then you go to project specific meetings, which is on the right column about half the way down, there will be a clustering hackers meeting underneath that, which has the information. And it is 8 a.m. PST on Tuesdays. Um, and then I guess we should probably standardize on using either MD cell or cluster or controller. But um, for people, but I guess if people send it either place, you guys will pick it up. So I'm just trying to make sure that if we're going to stop in eight minutes for some people, they can pick it back up. Yeah, so, and since um, most of clustering is currently in controller, we kind of default to that. If we start moving it out, we'll obviously move, move to a new project and new mailing list and what have you. Okay, um, any other questions? Yeah, or? I have uh, one other question. Yeah. Uh, oh. Earlier we said uh, clustering data change listener is the kind of the recommended pattern, right? Instead of doing RPCs, et cetera. Um, um, I'll hand the mic off to <laughs> Moise because I don't know anything about that. No, I, I think the question is uh, general. You also probably can answer. The clustering data change listener assumes you at least have a replica local to your node, right? A shard replica. So my question is, especially with fine-grained sharding, do I have to assume my application will always be co-located at least with a replica? Or do we have any notions where a data change listener well, can we do, be registered? We do have the, we, I think we do have the infrastructure to essentially have non-voting uh, followers, which means that we can instantiate a replica to be collocated with any data change listener. Like automatically? When Aut I automatically. We do have the means. It, it, it hasn't been implemented, but it is possible to do, do it, and it's not that hard. Okay, so that no, I think uh, Colin is. I think he's bringing up a point where, like, let's say I want to actually listen, get, return uh, all nodes in inventory. Then what am I going to do? I'm going to say, okay, 
uh, listen on slash nodes, right? Because I want all the nodes in inventory. Um, Let's say I'm doing open flow and all nodes in inventory is what I want to listen. So you shouldn't be really listening on the list, but you want all the nodes in a particular inventory, so you should be listening on that inventory's top level node. No, which is fine. So I want all the nodes. So right, yeah. Nodes. Yeah, exactly. Now if I do that, and I have fine grain sharding, right? So each, no, each shard, shard contains only a single node, then won't I have all the shards rep, like, you know, replicated to my local node? Um, uh, no, so uh, this is where I start drawing things. Um, so um, it's, it's not the nodes themselves, but the contents of the nodes usually. So, so you want to take a particular uh, topology instance and listen for all the nodes and essentially all the data, I guess. Um, okay, that's not really something you should be doing, but if you need to, um, so, so what we'll end up doing is um, yes, uh, replicating all the shards and all the data locally to you. For example, it will have to be done by rescon. Right? If rescon doesn't do it, it won't be able to serve a request for all nodes in an inventory. Um, yes, but but the thing is, the, the what, what restconf will end up doing is is creating a tem temporary uh, registration to to get all the data. Yeah, There's no way around it. You you have to collect the data anyway. But as soon as it does it, all the data will have to be replicated to that node. Yes. Um, and this is, and I will argue that this is not the use case we should be optimizing for. I know, but because at, at that point we, we end up having to have all the data on all the nodes, which is not what we want to do. And a typical application will have only a small subset of things that it's interested in. And this is where our performance should lie. But as long as we have RESCON, how do we avoid this scenario? We well, we, 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 no, 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 we, no, we, we cannot. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. I don't know when. All right, we can. Well, yeah, we can. Uh, I'm not sure what the 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 layout of things is. So, yeah. So uh, one point I wanted to make sh uh, certain we cannot get around to do that, but it's not the the case we need to optimize for. And I think it's it's fair to 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 extract a fair performance hit on things that are doing it because it's not a something that you should be doing. I'll tell you a specific use case. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you a very specific use case. Okay. For a very Between real estate. Yay. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so the second part that that we, we kind of looked at is uh, making the the code base more modular, um, kind of untangled uh, solid distributed data store, um, because it currently hosts the distributed data store, the entity ownership service, the configuration admin for for shards, which kind of they they are related components, but some of them are loosely coupled and just use APIs provided by the data store backend and just build functionality on top of that and con control it, whereas the, the other part is it has a front end back end. And the, the interactions <laughs> between them um, are not that clear because well, we, while, while we have some, some documentation around that, um, a lot of times if you, if you just open a file, you're not, you're not sure whether you're looking at the front end code or the back end code. Um, and how it relates to 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 do all, all the other things. So uh, the other point is to make um, um, make code base more modular. On the item, so um, item one essentially was um, upgrading to to Akka and get get advantage of uh, Java eight and kind of start start working on that. Uh, we've already upgraded Scala to two eleven. So that was upgrade um, Scala uh, to 11 and Akka uh, to 4x. We already do have patches. <laughs> yeah, come closer, please. <laughs> 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 
Um, so, so we already have Scala upgraded. We actually did that, that in Beryllium. I think there, there was a substantial um, performance boost coming out of that. I think it was somewhere, somewhere around 10% or thereabout. Um, yeah, and it's really sim well, made, made things simpler a bit. And the ACA, it's up for review. I mean, uh, you, you finished up to. Yes. It's in progress. It's in progress. I've actually tested it. Um, and no backwards compatibility issues. But I saw it with the uh, level of compute. So, in other words, the database that was uh, written to 311, yeah. the previous version, 241 reads the yeah. back file. So, yeah, so, so, so the uh, per persistence didn't get break, broken. Just to make sure everyone understands what we're talking about, the form requires Java 8, right? We will not make anybody try to run. At, at this point, at this point, you cannot compile Open Daylight with Java 7. Okay, it won't work. Okay. So, e even, so even though you can, you, you can compile a downstream project, it will not run on Java 7. So that's that went in something like three weeks ago or thereabout. It was just using, I think, byte to unsigned byte or something, some library function that went in. And we actually uh, do have a, a conversion to to use lambdas lined up in one of the patches I submitted over the weekend. So so I, that that I that. Yeah, yeah, Eclipse does auto convert, so you get yeah. get get these surprises. Yay! <laughs> we no 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 longer have a function there. It's a lambda. Cool. So that's essentially making sure that we have uh, the front end uh, back end split. Um, and the the reason this is important is to is to kind of force the the thinking about well, what is it that the back end sees when somebody executes a transaction chain and what flows are there, what's the handoff between front and back end? Because, well, currently if, if you submit a large transaction, for example, um, and it takes a while to, to process at the back end, the, the front end, all, all it sees is a uh, ask timeout and nobody knows what, what's going on. And even though uh, everything is kind of fine because it's gonna recover in five seconds or, or whatever, suddenly the entire system breaks down simply because we, we don't know what, what, the, what the state of the transaction is, and we don't have the means to recover from it. So that's uh, front and back end split. Um, the other part is split out entity ownership service, because even though it's built on, on shard uh, as, the, as the back end thing, there, there is a, a semi well-defined well uh, interface of what that entity ownership service really does. And it turns out it just uses Raft plus the data store thingies. And uh, we already have, um, I think, two issues, uh, two corner cases where, where it doesn't really behave that well. And just fleshing those out will give us um, the means to, to actually fix those things. The, one of them is cleaning up entities when they no longer have any candidates. Uh, that was brought up by the OVSDB folk. And the other part is when you uh, force a split brain in a cluster and essentially the, the, the leader is in the minority partition, that, that's when, when you actually can see two leaders if you're a, an external device. So, so those two things we will be definitely fixing in, in Boron and we'll see whether we can back, backport that. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, sorry to have you kept waiting. Um, so I don't have a presentation. I was kind of thinking of more of a whiteboard kind of thing and discuss what we want to do in Boron with clustering, with respects to uh, stability, upgrades. All, how do we evolve this thing? Because it, it is the core of, of Open Daylight. Everybody is using it. Everybody sees a few problems. Um, we have a few developers working on it, so we kind of need to uh, focus our resources uh, get into alignment, what we're doing, who's doing what, when, and what we want to get out of, out, out of this release. And I would kind of like to, to solicit also feedback, what would the experience is, what, what we, can we do better going forward. So I guess everybody knows the SID and, and the password, so I'm just gonna flip this. Um, 
and I guess start off uh, with a couple of things that uh, things that we uh, talk with uh, Mois and Tom. Uh, what what needs to be done to to get the the code base into a better shape so everybody can well essentially jump in and and get something fixed because currently I think clustering is something like what 47 or 60 thousand lines of code and it's not really easy to get into it and understand what's going on where so um, I'll just write down, write, write down